Welcome back to our third installment about exploding bubbles. We've progressed from looking at a Bunsen burner and flame to exploding some bubbles. The second one, we looked at Hess's law basically. We took the individual heats of formation and constructed an energy diagram. The first thing we, uh, happened in the reaction is we broke up the carbon and hydrogen and that re is an endothermic reaction because we had to put energy in to break it up. Normally this would be shown in a table as a negative just as these are but now that we've got them into the individual components we bring it back down and approximately what we have here is about a little less than 500, a little uh, less than 400, so that's a little, quite a bit less than uh, 850, say, and we take off that, so we're about 800 kilojoules per mole. That's interesting, that's what's represented in the heat coming off of that methane. The other thing that's interesting and important to note is that initially we had to put a little bit of energy into the reaction and that was represented by the flame that came up underneath the bubble and that is the first step. We might look at that and say to ourselves, wouldn't it be nice if we could do away with that? But no, this is critical because we don't want that reaction happens spontaneously. If we didn't have to go up something here, it would happen spontaneously. And uh, much like nitroglycerin in the Old West, if you've seen the movies when they've got nitroglycerin, all you have to do is shake it up and it gets enough energy to go up there from the friction inside. So this is critical. We start a reaction, we light, a, for instance, a candle, and after we vaporize some wax and such, we get all that light and heat out of a candle. We control that by the surface area of the wick. But now we're going to look at another reaction. I said this reaction was critical in our society because we generate energy and heat with this. We heat our homes, we run our cars on this type of reaction. But I'm going to look at another type of reaction that is constantly going on inside your body, and that is metabolism. We'll take one type of metabolite, and that's glucose, and we'll put that in red to kind of keep it from all of this other material that's going on. We'll take C6H12O6 plus oxygen goes to the same products, basically, but in different amounts, carbon dioxide, <coughs> water, and energy, <clears throat> which is what we need to run the body. We breathe out the carbon dioxide and we can use the water elsewhere. Six carbons, six carbon dioxide, 12 hydrogen, six waters. Now we just have to figure out how much oxygen we need. We've got six oxygen here, we've got 12 here, that's 18. Six of them we get from our glucose, so we need 12, and that's six diatomic oxygens. Now, what type of curve does it look like? It looks similar to this one, except we've already ha we have to invest a little bit of energy in breaking the oxygen and hydrogen and the oxygen and carbon down. So let's start it over here. At some level, we have to increase it to the components, then we get all this energy out. Again, I'm not going to calculate all these numbers for us right now, but what I am going to do is take a moment and erase this right here so I've got more room to explain what the body does with this, because we've got a problem with the body. We can't we don't have a little candle inside of us with a wick. We don't have some place that just actually burns the glucose. We don't want it burning inside of us. What we want to is extract all this energy out. And the way that's done 
is if you've had a course in biology, it's called the Krebs cycle. Now the Krebs cycle, I'll just diagram it something like this. And there's nine steps in it. And there's various components. And out of this, we put in a low energy material, let's say A, D, P, and take out a high energy material, A, T, P. And it's this high energy material that is used by the body. In the process, what we're doing is we're taking that energy out of some components. What makes this cycle nice is what we start with up here, pyruvate, goes around and through a series of reactions where we're, sometimes we're putting energy in and sometimes we're putting in extra bonds and such, as we take it out. The net result is instead of taking it out in one here, we go in something like, let's go back to red because we're talking, trying to talk about glucose. We start off at one level. We put a little bit of energy into it. We take a little bit out. I'm going to turn the arrow back that way. A, D, P to A, T, P. And we take some other material out and N, A, D plus goes to N, A, D, H. And we take some other out. We just do it in little steps. As this goes around, we've got these little steps. Another way to symbolize this is it flows like a roller coaster. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and so forth. And we extract the energy out of this. Now, this is a very crude representation. What I'm going to do is go to a series of slides and annotate this in more detail that you can actually see the molecules. You uh, can see that as this progresses around, it rebuilds there. And what is important is that these are all mediated by enzymes. If you do not continue in this, there's three things I want you to understand about biological metabolism. One, it's controlled in very short steps, taking out little packets of energy. These are like batteries. The body will use these at various places for energy. It has broken this glucose down, and basically we make uh, kind of the starting material. Glucose feeds in here, forms pyruvate, and we uh, um, end up with taking the energy out of glucose. It is estimated that if you have one glucose molecule, you get about uh, 30 ATP, 36 ATP, depending on who's counting, what is called leakage and such. This is all developed, and it's a very complex mechanism, and I want you to either if this satisfies your curiosity, fine. Sometime when you're taking a chemistry course, a biology course, you may want to come back and look at these slides that I'm preparing for you and will annotate for you. So in the meantime, thank you for watching the third installment of Exploding Bubbles, or better yet, how to extract energy from two reactions that advance civilization. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. B again. Thank you for continuing with our exploration of the Krebs cycle. And the system for metabolism and the Krebs cycle is in the middle square. Each of these sections is just as complex as the Krebs cycle and obey basic thermochemical principles. Most, but not all, energy is added to the various systems by two molecules, ATP and NADH. The Krebs cycle is one of the sources for these two molecules. The difference between the burning of methane bubbles or of a candle is the removal of energy in the cell from glucose in a controlled manner. Two critical reactions take energy away 
from the bonds. One is adenosine diphosphate, ADP, plus phosphate ion, plus energy, goes to ATP. And nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide, or NAD+, plus, plus H+, plus, and energy, yields NADH. Each of these molecules, ATP and NADH, are similar to batteries used to power the rest of the cell flow chart. Only part of the energy harvest is shown. In the upper corner, pyruvate, a three carbon compound, is formed by glycolysis, where glucose, a six carbon sugar, is split into two pyruvate molecules. Next, acylcholate displaces carbon dioxide and the bond energy is transferred to NAD plus to form NADH and the hydrogen plus. Take a moment and count the number of times NAD becomes NADH and H plus. Each time some bond is broken in these compounds and a small packet of energy collected for the cell. Each of these reactions involves several components and the mechanism is fine-tuned by the required enzyme shown in red print. In each case, the enzyme lowers the activation energy to complete the reaction. Instead of heat to start a reaction, a specific enzyme is used. Now there are nine steps involved in this cycle. I asked you to count the number of times NAD plus goes in and NADH comes out and energy transferred. Count them. Did you count three? The FADH and the GDP are similar reactions. Now let us drill down further and look at one reaction in the Krebs cycle from 10 meters. Here's what is happening. The carbon dioxide circled in alpha ketoglutarate is exchanged for CoA enzyme and the energy in the bond transferred to the NAD+, the blue arrow. In the next step, the CoA coenzyme that is momentarily attached to the gray carbon atom is removed and additional energy is stored in GDP plus phosphate plus energy goes to GTP. This single step, when written with a few letters, some abbreviations, and a few colorful spheres, looks simple. Still, it is made possible by a complex enzyme for that particular reaction, the one that speeds up and controls this reaction. No enzyme at this step, and the whole cycle blows a tire. At one meter, the enzyme looks like. This diagram hints at the complexity of the enzyme. It is not unusually long or complex for an enzyme, and consists of 382 amino acids linked in a long chain. The red bands are amino acid in an alpha helix, and the blue band are beta pleated sheets. The enzyme works by binding to the substrate alpha ketoglutarate, holds the molecule in the correct position so when the NAD plus and the CoA approach, the reaction leads to the loss of carbon dioxide and energy and the energy is stored in NADH. My, my main points are, one, like the start of the hydrogen bubble, the whole process is controlled with an endothermic energy of action and availability of substrates and enzymes. All three have to come together. Two, a cell is incredibly complex and the way components are organized steps in the collection of energy and the control of each step by large complicated enzymes. Finally, a question. Which do you think is more likely, the random assembly of these parts to make the first cell, or the careful design of components, selection of compounds, and the construction of enzymes by a creator?